far in the east. There lies an almost limitless, almost boundless, almost unending stretch of land. People call it the wild fields. The vast grassy steppe that stretches all the way from Ukraine to Mongolia. The wild fields were home to many free-spirited and tough nomadic peoples. Though different from one another, they were linked intricately by their ways of life, the life of nomads. Many legends surfaced from this sea of grass in the east like the female warriors of the Amazons. And indeed, women in the nomadic societies of the steppe lived their lives very differently from the women in sedentary states. For the sedentary states and empires bordering the steppes, these nomadic steppe peoples usually were not a threat. Unless they combined their strengths for a common cause or under the leadership of a charismatic Khan. United, their raids devastated border regions and could even bring the most powerful of empires to its knees. Be it China in the east, Persia in the south, the Byzantine Empire in the west, or the Kievan state in the north, they all had their encounters with the power of the steppe peoples, one way or another, at some point in time. In this video, we paint a picture of how these peoples lived, how they formed some of the most dangerous armies in the world, and what could be done to counter them. This is the world of the Eastern Steppe. As some have learned again just recently, trying to conquer what is unconquerable has never been a particularly bright idea. Unconquerable, though, is exactly what the Eastern Steppe has always been. Back in the first millennium BC, the Greek historian Herodotus, dubbed the father of history, recounts how Darius the Great, king of Persia, sent a military expedition into the steppe. The ancient people inhabiting this part of the steppe, called the Scythians, quote, decided against a straight fight in favor of retreat. They would fill in any wells and springs they passed and destroy any vegetation they found, end quote. The Persians pursued them through the Pontic steppe and across the river Don, but all in vain. They exhausted their supplies and had to abandon their pursuit so that the hunters became the hunted. The Persians were pitilessly chased down by the Scythians. Darius the Great himself got out only by fleeing headlong towards Thrace and abandoning a large part of his army. Such an occurrence was not a peculiarity to the Pontic steppes in the west, or the Scythians for that matter. Pretty much the same scenario repeated itself on the eastern side of the steppe when the army of the Chinese emperor Cao Tzu was cut off and annihilated by the Hu Songnu, a people dominating the eastern steppe from the 3rd century BC to the 1st century AD. The historian Shane O'Rourke notes that the expeditions into the unconquerable land of the steppe have only brought any modicum of success since the 18th century. Of course, the terrain itself and their intricate knowledge of the terrain played into the hands of the steppe people when it came to warfare, even though their way of life would not really give away the impression of a feared warrior society. Their nomadic lifestyle largely consisted of raising livestock and moving from pasture to pasture, a way of life totally adapted to the harsh environment of the steppe. The continental climate produces hot summers and piercingly cold winters. The moderating influence of the nearby Black and Caspian Seas and the Sea of Azov is not very strong and does not reach far inland. If we zoom out, it becomes apparent that the eastern steppe forms a large horizontal belt from Eastern Europe almost to the Pacific Ocean. In the far north of it lies the tundra or area of permafrost. Right beneath is the forest zone, which gradually thins out as it moves south, slowly petering out until there are almost no trees left. Here begins the real step. Trees only grow naturally along riverbanks, as there is too little rain to support them elsewhere. This also means that there is almost no wood that could be used as building material. The only vegetation is grass, 
except for some weeks in spring, when in the north, beautiful fields of tulip, peony and sage transform the otherwise monochrome landscape. In the south, the steppe stretches all the way to the Caspian Sea, the Caucasus Mountains, the Black Sea and the deserts and mountains of Central Asia. Although there are patches of steppe east of the NSA River, which flows through Mongolia and Siberia, the real steppe begins at the foothills of the Altai Mountains and rolls all the way westward along the 50th parallel passing Aktyubinsk and Uralsk in modern-day Kazakhstan. From here it flows southwards towards the Caucasus, before turning northwestward through the Volga, Don and Dnieper rivers. The steppe really is a wonder of nature. Its vastness and beauty are truly staggering. A beauty worth protecting. Which leads us to today's sponsor, REN. REN is a website where you can calculate your carbon footprint and then offset it by funding various carbon reduction projects like tree planting in East Africa or rainforest protection in South America. In my group of friends or work environment, offsetting one's carbon footprint has not really entered the conversation yet. Many try their best with recycling and reducing their intake of certain goods, but you can't reduce your footprint to zero anyways. So, in my humble opinion, out of all climate activism, offsetting one's footprint is probably the most productive solution for the problem for an individual. For that, REN is a good starting point, because they are very pragmatic about how they do, what they do, and they're also transparent. Every single one of their projects, such as the community tree planting they do in East Africa, follows a rigorous monitoring plan, and they also quantify how many trees they plant, and in how far that offsets your carbon footprint. If you're into dealing with the climate crisis in a pragmatic and effective way, then check them out by clicking the link in the pinned comment and description. The first 100 people who sign up will have 10 extra trees planted in their name. Now back to the eastern steppe. It's not hard to imagine that it was difficult to wage large-scale war in such a terrain, especially for outsiders. Within the vast steppe, there didn't tend to be large-scale war, but another kind of brutality was thriving. Banditry. Let me introduce you to the Franciscan friar William of Rabrak. Only a few contemporary paintings of him exist, so we made our own version. William made the incredible journey across the steppe to Karakorum in Mongolia in the mid-13th century. He describes bands of bandits that kill, quote, whomever they come across by night. By day, they stay in hiding, and when their horses are tired, they come out to a large pasture of land and change their horses. They also take away one or two of them, so they can eat them. So, our guide was very much afraid of meeting such men." End quote. Despite such danger, William made it all the way to the Mongol Khan and proposed an alliance between Christians and Mongols in order to combat the Muslims in the Middle East. However, the Khan was not interested at all. So, William spent some time studying the Mongols and their different religions. His work is considered the first European description containing reliable information about the Mongol Empire. The structures of any given society are typically an answer to challenges that life throws at it. In the steppe, women usually played a different societal role compared to their counterparts in sedentary empires. In the steppe, the constant dangers of banditry, warfare and abduction taught women to fight. Besides that, the tasks of daily life were apparently not strictly divided into jobs for men and women. Not coincidentally, the Pontic steppe was regarded as the home of the legendary female warriors, the Amazons. While these women are often regarded as material of myth, there might be a kernel of truth to them. The previously mentioned ancient Greek historian Herodotus describes what he believed to be the direct descendants of the Amazons, which he calls the women of Soromatai. Quote, the Soromatian women have kept to their original way of life. They go hunting on horseback 
with or without their husbands. They go to war and wear the same clothes as men do." End quote. It's worth noting that Herodotus is a controversial figure. He recorded many strange stories, such as gold digging ants in ancient Persia, or Scythians ritually cleaning themselves in a steam bath with hemp seeds. While there are skeptics who do not trust him at all, recent findings support some of his claims. For example, he claimed that the Egyptians had a certain type of ship that was thought to be technologically impossible to build at the time. But archaeologists lately unearthed chips that perfectly fit Herodotus's account. While there is little other evidence to support Herodotus's claim, another 13th century Franciscan friar, John of Plano Carpini, wrote a description of a Mongol woman who bears uncanny resemblance to Herodotus's account. Quote, Young girls and women ride and gallop on horseback with agility like the men. We even saw them carrying bows and arrows. Both the men and women are able to endure long stretches of riding. They have very short stirrups. They look after their horses very well. Indeed, they take the greatest care of all their possessions. Their women make everything. Leather garments, tunica, shoes, leggings and everything made of leather. They also drive the carts and repair them. All the women wear breeches and some of them shoot like men. All of this is by now well supported by archaeological evidence, at least with regards to the Middle Ages. Many graves were found, with women lying buried with armor and weapons, their bones often bearing the scars of battle. Now, given these different sources, it is quite likely that steppe women fought and worked much like men did. Normally, the peoples of the steppe lived in relatively small groups of nomads. But whenever the many clans of the steppe formed confederations, they created a military potential dwarfing those of any of the settled states in the periphery of the steppe. The best known example is, of course, that of Temujin, later called Chinggis Khan. In the steppe, small warlords were constantly fighting and raiding each other but it was extremely rare that they all united under one single commander. The historian Shane O'Rourke mentions two vital conditions that were required for nomadic societies to transcend the normal limits of their societal organization. Quote, one was a charismatic leader, and the other was the ability to supply a constant source of goods to followers. Luxuries for the elite, and basic necessities for the lower orders. End quote. Both were rarely met. Mostly due to the fact that not everything could be produced in the steppe with its limited resources. For example, ordinary nomads needed basic trade goods that required large forges or the like, which they could only acquire in the border towns of the periphery. For the elites, the settled states offered luxuries which they could share with their kin as a symbol of their status and leadership. There was one status symbol these elites particularly desired, foreign princesses. A Chinese or Byzantine princess brought enormous prestige to a nomadic leader, which in turn could be used to motivate more people to join his forces. The settled states around the steppe often sold their princesses to appease the nomadic states. In 200 BC, for example, a Chinese princess was given to the Hussong Nu Attila the Hun partly went to war with Rome in 450 AD because they had failed to deliver Augusta Honoria, the sister of Emperor Valentinian III, as his bride. The Byzantine emperors and the Khazar rulers often exchanged royal brides. Justinian II, for example, married his sister to a Khazar ruler. At the end of the 7th century, Leo III, known as the Osorian, married his son to a Khagan princess. Besides status symbols, the nomadic states required all sorts of goods to sustain themselves. One way to obtain them was by military force, but this was costly and normally just a short-term solution. A more sustainable method than plundering was to simply threaten people. Raids by nomadic confederations were horrible and could devastate entire regions for years to come. 
This was something the Romans, Chinese and Byzantines knew all too well. So what does a good empire do when they're under threat? Of course, they pay the invader to convince them not to raid and pillage the land. Just like that, nomadic states could generate a steady flow of goods often referred to as tributes from the surrounding empires who, of course, deeply resented the nomadic extortion racket. The Byzantine emperor Constantine Porphyrogenitus advised his son, quote, Know, therefore, that all the tribes of the north have, as it were implanted in them by nature, a ravaging greed of money, never satiated, and so they demand everything, and hanker after everything, and have desires that know no limit or circumspection, but are always eager for more, and desirous to acquire great profits in exchange for small service." End quote. Interacting with the nomadic confederations was usually very costly. Not only because they had to pay tributes to keep the steppe peoples from raiding their land, but more so because it shattered their very worldview and self-perception. Stable, sedentary empires usually saw themselves as the center of the world and refuge of civilization. In their view, the steppe tribes were mere barbarians. To reconcile these views with the actual balance of power, they insisted that the nomadic leaders approach them through a cultural network in which they acknowledged their subjection to imperial power, for example by having them bow before them or receiving them in a formal setting such as a palace. Even if this was far removed from reality of the relationship, these kinds of interactions may very well have helped the sedentary empires to combat the nomadic states. As they stayed at the royal palaces, many steppe rulers became somehow attracted to the empires, especially when an empire was in a difficult position and was not interested in fighting the steppe people in open battle. Then, empires would offer the steppe leaders ranks and titles, effectively making them look like the aristocracy of the sedentary empire in some sense. Once the steppe peoples accepted these conditions, the empire could disguise the tributary payments as gracious gifts. This had wide-ranging effects, because many steppe leaders had more and more contact with the elites of the empires and gradually adopted the cultural lifestyle of the empire. They became Byzantinized and Sinicized. One could say the comforts of a Chinese royal court were far superior to even the most luxurious nomadic Europe. But this came at a great cost. Far removed from their source of power, the clans and kinship relations of the steppe peoples and tribes, these leaders inevitably eroded the foundation of their rule. The most complete and best known of such a cycle of conquest and collapse were the Mongols. While Genghis Khan remained in the steppe and was as powerful as ever, his sons came closer and closer to the Chinese court which ultimately contributed to factionalism and weakening of their power. If you want to keep someone from entering your land, you really don't have a lot of effective choices. The Chinese built a wall, well actually many walls, as the Great Wall of China was really a series of walls which sometimes successfully held off the nomadic attacks from the north. But ultimately, the walls failed China many times, even if they tried various forms and locations. Another means to hold off unwanted nomads was much more successful. Let's turn our attention westwards. In the 9th century AD, a state emerged on the outer edges of Eastern Europe, the Kievan Rus. The origins of the Kievan state are controversial. One among many theories is that they started out as a tributary to the Khazars of the Western Steppe. This would have had a few upsides, such as a certain degree of protection against the other tribes of the steppes, such as the Pechenegs. Be that as it may, one thing is clear. The Kievan Rus were powerful enough to challenge the Khazars for the control of the lucrative trade routes of the Northern Silk Road that were the foundation of Khazar prosperity. In 964, 
the Rus, under their prince Svatoslav, defeated the Khazars and pushed the borders of the Kievan state to the Volga. But this had its drawbacks. He exposed his realm to a constant attack of the other steppe tribes. Only four years later, in 968, the Pashanaks besieged Kiev and in 972 they killed Svatoslav, who was on his way home from an unsuccessful raid into Byzantine territory. So, getting rid of the buffer zone in form of the Khazars backfired badly for the Kievans. It took another 50 years until the Kievans defeated them under Svatoslav's nephew, Yaroslav the Wise. However, the next tribe, the Cumans, was already at the ready. For most of their history, the Kievan Rus developed strategies that closely resembled those of the Byzantines and Chinese. Warfare, bribes, alliances and royal marriages were all used to hold off the constant flood of the steppe warriors raiding their borderlands. These strategies worked reasonably well until the 13th century, even though the Kievan state had always struggled to maintain such a long border to the steppe due to little natural obstacles to hold the steppe tribes off. So when the Mongols invaded them, they quickly crumbled and were subjugated. The Kievans had learned a valuable lesson when they defeated the Khazars. The best defense against the steppe tribes was another steppe tribe. Over time, they actively recruited Turks, Pashanaks and Berendei and others in their service. But not even this was enough to resist the power of the Mongol hordes. Still, it proved a valuable strategy and all the empires around the steppe learned and adopted it at some point. One example where it worked out reasonably well is to be found in the 16th and 17th century when the Cossacks were employed by Muscovy and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth to deal with the raids by the Tatars, who were one of many successors of the Golden Horde. The Golden Horde of the Mongols had lost its power and disintegrated in the 15th century. Out of the ashes of the Golden Horde, many new Khanates emerged, that claimed to be its rightful descendants, such as the Kazan, Astrakhan and Crimean Khanates. However, in the north, Moscow, a small polity under Mongol rule that had emerged as the most powerful Russian principality also laid claim to the Khan's throne. The disintegration of the Golden Horde left a vacuum of power over the vast area of steppe between the Volga and Dnieper rivers. Nomadic raiders took to the opportunities and began a lucrative slave trade with the Ottoman Empire. Thousands of people were carried off by Tatars and sold on these booming slave markets. Fear of these raids alone led to entire regions around the steppe being depopulated. The borderlands were left to the men of the border town garrisons and adventurers. Gradually, a harsh and dangerous frontier zone was created. Only foolish freebooters, frantic fugitives, ordinary outlaws or bold bandits would dare to inhabit this region. This was the Wild East. And this was the world of the Cossacks.